federal program that is supposed to match refugees with healthcare jobs has been unable to actually bring the workers to Canada. Kenight in Nunavut declares a state of emergency over water crisis. Two brothers in Vancouver have racked up nearly 70 health and safety violations with their two asbestos abatement companies. WestJet pilots are closer to going on strike and the U.S. is about to get its first unionized strip joint again. Good morning. It's Thursday, May 18th. I'm Nora and here are your headlines. This morning, we start in Nova Scotia, where CBC's Kayla Hounsell has reported that a federal program that is intended to bring refugees to Canada to work in skilled jobs is not actually bringing refugees to Canada to work in skilled jobs. The program is called the Economic Mobility Pathways Pilot. In Nova Scotia, employers have made 121 job offers through the program, but only 17 people have actually arrived. Nova Scotia has made the most number of requests of any province. I'll pause here. I have to note that it's so backwards and messed up that our idea of helping people who need to find a place to live is by giving them a job. Like, can we not just help people? Can we not just settle refugees in Canada and then allow them to decide if they want to work in healthcare or not, rather than making it contingent on whether or not they can leave a particular refugee camp? With oversight of the program so good that they can't even get people to come to Canada with a job offer, are we supposed to believe that these workers will be protected once they come to Canada? Anyway, I'll go back to the story. Hounsell talks with Patricia Kemsor and Abdifata Sabrie. They live in a refugee camp in northwestern Kenya. They have passed English exams, shown their healthcare experience, and have been offered jobs in Mahone Bay at a new long-term care facility that's owned by the McLeod Group. Neither has been told anything about their jobs or when they can expect to start. Sean Fraser, the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, wouldn't comment on the CBC story. He was, quote-unquote, not available. Now to Kenite in Nunavut, where the territorial government has declared a state of emergency. The community of about 1,400 people is facing a water shortage due to an electrical problem at the community pump house. The state of emergency has been called and is supposed to last for 14 days. People are being asked to conserve water. I'll just note that this is the second story that's about Nunavut from CBC News that I've read in the Daily News in a row now, where there's no journalist actually listed as having written the story. This is a problem because if you live there and you want to contact the journalist or fix something in the story or know who's even paying attention to your community, you can't. You can't find out. You have no idea. You don't know the person that is writing this stuff. So anyway, CBC. That sucks. When Iqaluit had a water crisis in 2021, the Canadian military brought in a water treatment unit that temporarily treated the water and thousands of bottles of water were also sent to the city. The article doesn't say what the next steps are for Kenite other than the state of emergency gives the government extraordinary powers. Next to Vancouver, where a judge has ordered brothers Rajesh and Gagandeep Joshi and their companies to stop violating provincial workers' health and safety regulations. Their companies, EHZ Pre-Demolition and AMK Environmental Limited, do asbestos abatement. A BC Superior Court judge examined 10 work sites that warranted administrative penalties. From January 2019 to September 2021, the brothers and their companies received 59 orders and nine administrative penalties. They violated 30 different sections of the province's occupational health and safety laws. The brothers had already been sanctioned for workers' health and safety violations. But that didn't convince them to fix their operations, reports Ian Holiday with CTV News Vancouver. For previous health and safety violations, the pair was sanctioned to take more educational courses and learn more about the health and safety legislation. I think that's a bit weird personally, as it assumes that bosses make errors with health and safety by accident and not because, you know, they're bad managers and they don't care about workers' health. The brothers had argued that they shouldn't have to be subject to all of the orders, which is why it landed at the B.C. Superior Court. The court disagreed. Now to national news. On Friday, members of the Airline Pilots Association are ready to walk off the job. The 1,800 WestJet and Swoop pilots are fighting for higher wages. WestJet blames their stinginess on the pandemic. They're making it sound like the pilots are asking for huge sums of money in the media. 
But in an article for CBC, if you read down the page, you discover that Canadian pilots make nearly half of what American pilots make. They are also fighting over scheduling and job security. The company has lost 340 pilots in the past 18 months, though WestJet says that they've managed to hire three times that since. Of course, if you're planning to travel this long weekend with WestJet or Swoop, you might find yourself with a cancelled flight. In the midst of these negotiations, the Airline Pilots Association approved a merger of WestJet pilots with the Air Canada Pilots Association. They have 4,500 members. Together, the new unit will represent 95% of all pilots in Canada. Now that is coordinated bargaining territory and will certainly bring strength to both groups of pilots. And finally, good news out of North Hollywood for you to end today's podcast. The union Actors' Equity is about to get a new group of members, the dancers at the Star Garden Topless Dive Bar. The owners of the bar have agreed to recognize the union after having opposed it for months. The workers have been fighting for safer working conditions, better pay and health insurance, among other benefits. The bar's management pulled legal objections and challenges to slow down the process. Today, the formal vote will be counted by the National Labor Relations Board. The Associated Press quotes one of the workers saying, quote, we're hoping that we've done enough to unionize this club and that we've laid the groundwork for any other stripper in the country who decides that they also want to have a voice in the way their workplace is run, unquote, said Lilith, a dancer at Star Garden. There are currently no other unionized strippers in the United States. The last group to be unionized were workers at the Lusty Lady in San Francisco. They lost their union at the same time that the club shuttered in 2013. One of the problems that workers were routinely facing was that they couldn't go to security if they felt unsafe. The guards, quote, repeatedly failed to protect, unquote, dancers from abusive or threatening patron behavior. If a worker felt that they weren't safe, they had to go to management before going to security. It would be management that would then decide if they were actually unsafe and then ask security to get involved. When two workers raised safety concerns, management fired them. Their firing kickstarted organizing among all of the workers at the club who tried to get them rehired. In the process of organizing to get them rehired, they realized that their best path was a union. Those are your headlines for Thursday, May 18th. I'm Nora, and I hope you have a great day.